Okay. Um, I feel a bit shy about talking about a subject that so many people present have already done quite a lot of research into themselves. And I think I'm treading in some aspects quite a well-worn path. But I hope there's some things you don't know and I hope there's some things that I don't know that you can tell me at the end. I came into this um, quite accidentally really because um, this is a project we're doing around the Loch Broom area that was triggered by the Year of Coasts and Waters 2020. And Al Martin, which many of you have been to, was due to host a festival of all things seaweedy. Uh, so that's eating seaweed, bathing seaweed, in seaweed, recognizing um, which seaweeds are down on the shore, and knowing its importance in the marine ecosystem and protecting it, particularly at the moment, from commercial exploitation. And this put us in mind of all the previous commercial exploitation of seaware that there's been over the years, both for potash and for iodine, an industry that was really important in Scotland between about 1760 and right through into the 20th century. And Coeck and Ascent's Living Landscape Partnership gave me a small grant to run a community project investigating these historic uses of kelp around Loch Broom and working towards a reconstruction of a kelp burn during the actual festival, which was going to be in September. Next slide. So, as you probably all know, there's a huge amount of documentary evidence as to, you know, the number of tons of kelp that were produced in any given year and what the price was, um, what the landowners got for it, what the workers got for it. But we're only just beginning to realise that a lot of the archaeological evidence hasn't yet been recorded. I think there's a lot of sites you've all been to that aren't actually on the HERs yet. And the documentary evidence, although it gives us loads of information about the landowners, the leaseholders of the kelp shores, the merchants who are buying the kelp and transporting it, and the manufacturers and what they're doing with it, there's all the correspondence and everything, but there's virtually no voices at all of the actual people who did the cutting, the carrying, and the burning. And in all the reading I've done, I've only ever found one actual voice of a kelp burner. And that was in 1905, and it was a conversation that um, J.M. Singh was having with kelp burners on the Isle of Arran, the Arran Islands in Ireland. And he didn't ask the right questions. He didn't ask any questions. The man just said, oh, I bet you've never seen kelp being burnt before. And that was about it. Um, so this set of figures, for example, there's a there's really useful information here. This is printed in 1798, but you'll see that at this date there are no figures for the northwest coast. I think Ardnamurchan is about the furthest north that this gets to, apart from jumping to the Orkney Islands. But we do know that kelp was being produced around Loch Broom area, um, both from the bits of archaeology that we've found and from newspaper articles such as number three, please. And you'll see here that um, the Cromarty estates are offering all their West Coast properties. And this is actually a second letting. And I'll talk more about this a little bit later on. And they're mentioning the fact that the kelp on these shores is very valuable. Uh, next, please. And there are plenty of suitable shores around Loch Broom and Little Loch Broom. And our idea was that we would do a little bit of experimentation. And at the end of February this year, um, the Al Martin Seaweed Festival had a launch event. And I got lots of volunteers signed up who were going to come with me and learn what it was like to cut kelp and um, have a go at burning before the festival and all sorts of really hands-on things and they would then go and look at all the archaeology and they would do documentary research with me and then of course we went into lockdown and that stopped everything and the festival itself has now been postponed for a year and we're sort of trying to limp on keeping interest going with a Facebook page 
and some people have been experimenting a bit at home but it's sort of slightly fallen on me to push it onwards and because it's lockdown and I've been at home and not working I've been having some fun so this photo is actually the bottom of my croft and this is a spring low tide in April just gone and this tide is a 0.2 which only occurs about once a month for about four days and it exposes the lowest laminaria beds for a very short period of time just a couple of hours maybe and this is the seaweed that was being exploited for iodine in the later part of the 19th century and then you can just see at the sort of top of the beach there there's the dark weed which is the racks which were burnt for the potash and that's a much earlier phase of burning so they're much easier to get at you can get at them at much more tides of year so we started off because we had this particular low tide we thought we would um, start by cutting this while we had the opportunity next please so at this 0.2 tide, the laminaria roots, or I think they're called holdfasts, are actually dry. And it's a beautiful, strange seascape that you very, very rarely see, full of weird and wonderful things like this. And Ailsa McLennan, who's working with us on the R. Martin project, she's a marine conservationist, and she was advising us that it's fine to cut as long as you cut the stem and leave the roots intact because that's what the new growth of weed will come from. Um, next, please. So it's actually quite easy to cut. You can grab a handful, and if you have the sort of sickle that was used back in the day, you can cut several at a time. Uh, but this is my neighbour, socially distanced, using her pen knife, and I used a bread knife and we probably could have cut quite a large area um, just in one tide and a whole family all working together would make quite a difference to that area and the next picture please for experimental purposes we cut one area completely, every little bit of kelp we cut off that area, to find out, going back next year and the year after, how quickly it regenerated. Because I think the kelp beds were laid out so that one area was only cut every three years or four years. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it regenerates. This is at the bottom of my port, my boat port. So it's going to be quite easy to find it again. And actually it was doing us a favour because this is where we bring the boat in and where we swim and having the, the tall stems is a bit of a nuisance. So we generally do cut weed anyway. So anything that wasn't used in the experiments has gone on to our compost. Uh, next, please. Yeah. Can you see that? There, okay. But although it took no time at all to do the cutting, the problem was, oh, one too many. That's it. The problem was getting the cut weed up above the high tide line. Because at our bit of shoreline, to get down to the laminare, it's about 70 metres of scrambling over slippery rocks. And it's really hard work just to carry it manually. So the traditional way apparently was to leave the cut weed in the water, surround it by a rope and slow, slowly pull it in as the tide rose, which is fine, but it takes six hours for the tide to rise. And unless you've got six hours to spare, slowly pulling it in, um, it just didn't work any, I didn't have a long enough rope to actually go 70 meters all the way up to above the high tide. So we ended up cheating a little bit and doing quite a lot of hard hauling. Um, the problem as well at the time that we did this was that there was quite a strong breeze was trying to push all our cut weed 
along the shore. And if we just left it there with the rope around it and gone away and come back in an hour or so, it was going to be about a hundred meters further on and onto the next croft. So we haven't quite got that technique just yet. I think if we'd had a boat there, we could have loaded up a boat. But there's an awful lot of handling involved to be putting into a boat, taking out of a boat, getting it up the shore to wherever you're going to do the drying. Uh, so the drying is the next stage. Next picture, please. Yeah, we've got it, Cathy. Have you got it yet? No. Coming. There. Okay. Uh, so this requires good weather because apparently even a day of rain could spoil it for the burning. And in April, we were really lucky. We had really good hot, dry weather. And on the right, you've got the laminaria that we cut and the fence was excellent for drying this, not very traditional, but we didn't actually have time to be building any walls and the rocks I've got down there are quite small. So we used what we had. So the laminaria dried really, really quickly in two or three days of hot sunshine. Um, unfortunately, when we did a second cutting in May, lovely weather when we cut, the next day it rained, then it rained and rained, and that entire cutting just went into sort of white mush and was ruined. Went back again a few days ago, another low tide, cut again. Next day it rained again. So it's really frustrating. I don't know whether this is something to do with our present climate and in those days they could guarantee having three or four days of sunshine, but I'm suffering a bit from not getting the sunshine at the moment. And I'm trying to get it really dry because I'm not burning it straight away. I'm trying to store it until I can do the burn with all the other volunteers together, wherever we can do that. And the volunteers around the shoreline are doing their little bits of cutting as well. I've got people cutting in Polbain and um, Lochside and somewhere else in Achiltibui. So although none of us are cutting very much, when we get it all together, we're hoping it's going to be enough for them. So there's quite a lot of references to the amount of seaware that was required to be cut in order to burn to produce a ton of the product, the burnt product. And in 1811, there's an estimate that 18 tons of seaware was to produce one ton of the kelp. Um, I'm assuming that they weighed it as soon as they possibly could whilst it was still wet to get that weight. Uh, so how much is 18 tons? The next picture, please. It's coming. Okay, this is my jumbo truck. I think you probably all know these trucks. And I filled it as full as I possibly could to carry up and thought it was quite heavy and carried it up to the shed and found that that was effectively two stone of bladder rack, freshly cut. So that's approximately 12.7 kilos for the metrically minded. Interestingly, I weighed it after 24 hours when it hadn't rained and it had lost a third of its weight. Then the rain came and it just absorbed the moisture again. So in the next picture, you can see how many trucks you would need to make one ton of seaweed. And you need 18 times this burnt to produce one ton of the product. So that is a lot of kelp. And returning to the chart that we showed at the beginning, I won't, but if you remember that, it was saying that Barra, for example, was producing in one year 60 tonnes of, of the kelp. So that is an awful lot of seaweed. I'm going to change the subject now, um, next picture please, and start looking at the archaeology of it. Um, Kevin Grant of Historic Environment Scotland has just sent me a copy of an article he's recently written which is about the archaeology of the kelp industry, particularly with reference to South Uist. 
and he's identified quite a range of features other than just kelp kilns. For example, um, the kelpers' temporary dwellings, roads that have been built to give the kelpers access to the kelp shores, particularly on South Uist, where people live <coughs> on the Macher side, but they're going across to the east coast to do the cutting. And this is a feature he describes as a seaweed trap which apparently was built to store the cut seed temporarily. I've never seen anything like that, but I've never been looking. For. So I think there's a lot of archeological features in the landscape we don't know are associated with the kelp yet. Next one, please, Roland. So to begin at the beginning of the process, you can't cut, cut the kelp, obviously, where kelp won't grow. And all the landowners who didn't have suitably rocky shores had to go to the extreme length of creating kelp grids by laying out boulders. This is an example in Northern Ireland, uh, in Strangford Loch, but a similar grid has been identified on Sky at the head of Loch Skebost. Um, obviously, we don't need this on the northwest coast because we are generally a very rocky shoreline. And then, for getting the cut weed up the shore, I would have guessed that you could have modified the boat ports to make them wide enough to get a cart down. And it makes me wonder whether some of the boat ports, which are particularly wide, were modified in the day for that purpose. And we just haven't really thought about that. Next, please. So the next stage is the drying. And the drying walls on Orkney are quite well known. This is a very good example of these. Um, but it's likely that we're walking past odd bits of wall down on the shore uh, that have no clear function and just assuming that they're part of some previous enclosure system, but could have been built for dry kelp, like the next picture, which is an example I found on Tanner Moor. I should have looked further to see if there was actually any sort of kiln associated with this. I just couldn't work out why somebody was putting little lengths of walling at the top of the raised beach. Anyway, now we come to the actual burning process. And this is where it gets slightly more complicated because we've got about 150 odd years of needs and changing methods. Uh, we're starting off with producing alkaloids going through the potash for the soap and the glass industries, particularly during the Napoleonic Wars, and ending up with the iodine production at the end of the 19th century. And sort of lump this together as if the process was the same for all of these. Yet, I'm finding references to the burnt being a white ash and references to be, it being this bluish glassy substance that you have to knock out of the kiln. So are these two uh, different burning methods producing a different finished article? Um, so I've been trying to do a bit of reading and I'm very grateful to everyone that sent me articles which I've not had time to read in great detail but mostly what I'm referring to from now on is the transactions of the Highland Society. And they were constantly looking for ways to improve the kelp burning industry. And they invited essays on the subject. And in 1798, three separate essays were published by different authors. And two of these essays described the kelp kilns that these authors had observed as no more than a parcel of loose stones on the beach or a shallow depression lined with stones. Next pitch, please. Which is very, very much what we're seeing here in this, this is a late 18th century drawing, which is actually from the Northumberland coast. And it's very crude and very small. And the next one. <laughs> this is actually from the Scilly Isles. Um, and it's described as a kelp kiln. 
and it certainly fits the description of the, the shallow depression lined with stones. Um, next one, please. So I've been looking around on Scorig, and on the Annet side of Scorig, on the, the Loch Broom side, these, I don't know whether you can actually make them out, but there's a series of slight circular banks surrounding a depression. Uh, they're quite small, they're only about one meter diameter internally. And for a long time, I've been looking at these and thinking that they were too small to be kelp kilns and maybe they were potato clamps. But more recently, I've been back and looked at them again. And I think they probably were kelp kilns. And our plan had been to have a little deturf of one, a little bit of a fossic with the primary school and see what we'd find underneath. Next, please. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> it's very slow tonight. There we go. So there's another picture of the same depressions here, just to show how close they are to the shore. But meanwhile, that same 1798 transactions of the Highland Society, the third essay, describes the kilns that this author has seen as being rectangular of various lengths from 18 feet long, built up two and a half feet from the ground with a critical width, which ought to be always 28 inches. That's 700 mil for the metrically um, inclined. So this does appear to be the standard model. Next one, please, Roland for the examples that um, we've been seeing on the islands. It's coming, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Gosh, it's slow, isn't it? There we go. Okay, Kathy. So Paul, Paul Bain is obviously within our area. and This one hasn't been recorded yet. I think the other ones, quite a lot of you will have seen, and similar ones. Um, so the next picture. Um, that one. Yeah. Um, can I just say, Kathy, there's a suggestion from Norman that if people mm -hmm. um, close down their videos, um, that will improve the speed of the connection, um, which uh, I wasn't aware of. So don't, don't log out, but um, bottom left of your screen, if you click, uh, just unclick the video for the moment, we'll see if that helps. Thanks. Okay, Kathy, press on. Okay, so this is an excavated example. Uh, this is from Alt Crystal on Barra, and this was excavated by Pat Foster. And he noticed that there was no evidence for any burning. It was quite strange. There were no heat cracked stones. There was no charcoal or any material in between the stones that might have been associated with the kelp burning. And he said that this was a very similar result what had been found during excavations at the Brough of Bursay on Orkney where there had been some rescue digs of what were kelp kilns but because they couldn't find any burning stones or anything they revised their interpretation and said they probably weren't. Um, but then there's that really interesting photograph that Alan Thompson sent me of the eroding possible kelp kiln from Stromness in Orkney, which I didn't put into this, which is very definitely been modified by heat. So that's a, a strange question that might be resolved if we do get to do a little bit of fossicking in one or two around Loch Room. Next picture, please. So that sort of rectangular kiln is very much like this one, which is actually being burnt in Tony. This is a Breton seaweed festival. It's an annual festival. And during this festival, they actually do a seaweed burn. 
and this is I would say this is identical to those rectangular kilns that we've been looking at and there's a lot of photographs dating to the late 19th century Can you put the next picture on please um, obviously kelp burning was considered to be a picturesque subject and the women here appear to be performing exactly the same tasks as the Breton man but in all of these photographs they're always very spooky and it's almost impossible to make out what the kiln is like and in the next picture it's far easier actually to see in these drawings these are by Jack Yates um, this is 1905 on the Aran Islands and he's very clearly portraying the low dry stone walls and the very dense covering of sea wear on top of that it's really hard to tell to what exactly the tool is that the men are using because it seems to be more of a sort of paddle than a grape or something but I'm not actually looking very much at the tools at the moment. But I was noticing that this picture and the previous 19th century photograph and the Breton example, there's a character in each of those where someone's got a little bit of seaware in their hands that they're popping on by hand. And I think this is because it was quite important to stop the, the gaps opening up. So it had to be constantly vigilant to make sure that there was a a dense covering of seaweed so that the heat was trapped inside. The next picture please. So William Daniel, um, his tour of Great Britain between 1815 and 22, he frequently depicts plumes of smoke rising from presumed kelp kilns and you think this possibly is for dramatic effect but it could well be that he has been observing them in these locations. He notes, by the way, that the smell is perceptible at a distance of 20 miles. And he writes that the kelp is burnt in troughs recently made, of which the dimensions vary from 5 to 12 feet in length by 2 feet in breadth and from 12 to 18 inches in depth. So this detail here is actually from the Shant Islands where we used to do field work. So this gave us an opportunity to actually verify when we were surveying there whether there had been kelp being burnt at that particular location and it wasn't just an artistic device. Next please. Kathy, maybe we should just wind up a little bit. Okay, yeah, two more. So we found this substantial hut which we've described as a temporary kelp burner's hut. And the next one. Is um, a very it's poor kind of example of. A kelp kiln. Do you want me to stop? I've actually got three more. Oh, they're good pictures. Let's just rattle through them. OK, I'll rattle through. Next one. This is going back to Loch Broom now and our seaweedy project. And we've been doing a small amount of documentary research. And this shows that although kelp burning was introduced to Scotland from Ireland, probably in the 1740s, it didn't actually reach the northwest coast until about 1770. And it seems to have been initiated by the commissions for the annexed estates. And next picture, please. We have one Colin Mackenzie a kelp merchant in Loch Broom in 1770, who took credit for introducing the industry and wishing to take on the lease of Dorney and Al Ristel. So the picture on the left is an aerial shot of a circular kiln on the raised beach of Old Dorney. And the very poor picture at Ristel of a group of circular kilns at slow depressions, which we need to return to. And in the rest of Koyak, some circular and some rectangular kilns have been recorded, and I think there are many that haven't been recorded. Well, that's as far as actually we've got with the project. This is beginning the project. It's got so many directions that it can go in. And my last um, image, if you put that on, is just some paintings that have been done by a group of artists inspired by kelp cutting and burning in Brittany including Gauguin. It was obviously a very romantic 
occupation that the painters would sort of go out and um, record. Anyway, sorry if I've spoken too long or if there's been too long silence. 